a lot of people are, are saying that sort of people have been burying like that behind a school schoolyard or some of the people who could worse they, they got burned. Tonight, questions arise about the number of dead at residential schools in Quebec. These women should have been safe. These women should have been protected. More calls for the resignation of Winnipeg Police Chief Danny Smythe. It means a yes and approach. It means victims from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal will see their uh, uh, compensation paid. And the Assembly of First Nations moves forward on compensation for children. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. A story by Radio Canada's investigative program on CAT shows that there may be dozens of more deaths at residential schools in Quebec than previously suspected. Tom Fenario has the reaction and a warning. This story contains some disturbing images. It might not be obvious through the tall grass. But this place is where the former St. Malc de Figueri Residential School once stood. In 2019, several Anishinaabe and Atikamik survivors gathered here with their children to purify this place once and for all. But an investigation by Radio Canada has revealed that this reviled place may need to be revisited again. For us, as a First Nations, it's not unexpected. Just that we. I heard stories about it when I was young. Ronald Brazo is from Laksimo and Nishinaabe Nation, where many of the former students came from. My mom said that I heard my friends was there and I'll get a lot. Said that they don't know where they went. Said they were saying people, they were saying odd. Said the people were just odd. She got, she went back home. Said when she got, and after when they got back home, is she around here? No, she never came back. The investigation shows that there may be dozens of more deaths than the 38 already officially recorded by the Truth and Reconciliation Center. Among the evidence uncovered was this disturbing photo of the director of the St. Malk School attending the funeral of a student, even though there were no officially recorded deaths in the school. There's a lot of people who were saying that sort of people who have been burying like that behind a school schoolyard or some of the people who could worse, they, they got burned. The investigation also shined a light on possible unregistered deaths in the Mastioash, Latuk, and Setil schools. But the school with the most possible deaths is Fort George, on the Cree Nation of Chisazabi, where 12 children are unaccounted for. I know those types of stories are out there, and I'm looking to, to, to understand what it is we're going to find. Mandy Gulmasti is the Grand Chief of the Cree Nation government. She says a search is planned for this summer using a technology called LIDAR, which is capable of creating 3D imaging of what's below the surface. It's a two-year project. I think they're going to be able to have some preliminary answers. And there's also local engagement where they're gathering people's stories. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation was unable to respond to requests for comment before deadline. However, they did explain to Radio Canada that the discrepancy in numbers can be attributed to a lack of bilingual researchers during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's original examination of the situation in Quebec. They also hope to update the numbers soon. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Montreal. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. And that number is 1-866-925-4419. More voices are calling for the Winnipeg Police Chief to step down over the handling of the investigation into the killing of four Indigenous women. The bodies of two of the women are al allegedly killed by Jeremy Skibicki are believed to be in a Winnipeg area landfill, which was shut down yesterday. But police said earlier this week a search is not feasible. APTN's Leanne Sanders has the latest. The Southern Chiefs Organization joined the Association of Manitoba Chiefs and family members, all calling for the resignation of Police Chief Danny Smythe. The SCO also wants the Prairie Green Landfill to be declared an active crime scene and plans made for a search. SCO Grand Chief Jerry Daniels says the organization stands with Cambria and Kara Harris, daughters of the late Morgan Harris, in making the demands. In a news release, Daniels stated in part, Now is the time for the Winnipeg Police Service to take swift action in working to rebuild trust with our nations. 
Yesterday, the chief of Long Plain First Nation, where Harris was from, also called for Smythe to step down. And more than 1,600 people have now signed an online petition for his firing. Organizer Travis Barcy stated the families of the women deserve more. These women should have been safe. These women should have been protected. These women should have and deserve to um, be brought home to their families, and the families deserve it. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Well, and as you just saw, Indigenous leadership and MMIW advocates have been pressuring the Winnipeg police chief to resign. But now police chief Danny Smythe says he will not be quitting. Calls for Smythe to step down from his role followed a decision to not perform a search for the remains of Mercedes Myron and Morgan Harris in the Prairie Green landfill north of Winnipeg. In a news release, Smythe states he is supportive of further exploring whether it is possible to recover the remains. He wrote in part, I have heard the calls from the families, the Indigenous leadership and the community. I understand your calls. The pain and sorrow is unimaginable. As the Chief of Police, I am committed to securing a criminal conviction for these heinous crimes. I want justice for Rebecca, Mercedes, Morgan, and Buffalo Woman. I will not be resigning. Well, we'd like to hear what you think about this story. Here's how you can reach out to us. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on our website. That's at aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. In other news, the Assembly of First Nations Winter Meeting passed the critical resolution on Canada's $20 billion child welfare compensation agreement on Wednesday evening. The resolution directs the AFN executive to renegotiate the agreement it signed with the Trudeau government earlier this year. APTN's Fraser Needham has the details. There were a lot of hugs, tears and handshakes at the AFN assembly on Wednesday night. Thank you. Solution is carried by consensus. That's because at the 11th hour, both sides managed to come together on what needs to be done to compensate all victims of a chronically underfunded First Nations child welfare system. Under the resolution, the chiefs have directed the AFN executive to negotiate a new agreement with the federal government that pays each child and family covered under the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling a minimum of $40,000 starts flowing compensation money to victims immediately, ensures all victims are eligible for supports up to the age of 26, and requires the AFN executive to provide regular updates on the compensation implementation package. First Nations Child and Family Caring Society Executive Director Cindy Blackstock says the resolution means the federal government has no choice but to head back to the table to negotiate a new agreement. It means a yes and approach. It means victims from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal will see their uh, uh, compensation paid and then also uh, the, the class action can go forward. She says the government can keep the agreement it signed with the AFN executive last January, but they have been directed by chiefs from coast to coast to add to it to meet the rights tribunal's requirements is that these were victims who already were entitled to $40,000 through legal orders. And under the old arrangement, they would have seen that go down to zero. Now, thanks to the leadership, that's gonna remain at 40. And so that's what the agreement needs to deal with. Interviewed on APTN's Nation to Nation last month, Indigenous Services Canada Minister Patty Hyde, you said the government has no interest in reopening the agreement. Well, at this point, uh, we're confident that the 20 billion will suffice. And uh, but listen, I'm always interested in hearing um, uh, non uh, litiga uh, ways to ways to get to an agreement that aren't uh, that doesn't involve litigation. I think uh, you know reconciliation is about trying to find a path forward together. But what she said then is no longer accurate now based on the latest developments at the AFN Assembly. The summary decision, as I said, uh, that um, overturns really an agreement that is historic, that was negotiated with Indigenous people. The compensation regime that was planned and presented in the final settlement agreement was designed by First Nations people. And for his part, Justice Minister David Lametti dodged questions on the issue at the AFN Assembly on Thursday. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa.
And you can find much more on that story on our website as well, aptnnews.ca. Time for a quick break. Still to come, high prices in the north. How much it costs to fly to Yellowknife from one Northwest Territory community? I was scared because because seeing my child in pain from her from her abscess. Welcome back. The Keepers of the Water are wrapping up a two-day conference in Edmonton today. The conference was held because of worries about how industry expansion can threaten fragile water systems. The conference features several keynote speakers on how to protect water from industry. Topics included UNDRIP, the Indian Act, and how the tailings ponds from the tar sands are threatening the ecosystem and impacting Indigenous health and rights. A report will be made available containing findings from the conference. Nothing's changed in all of these years that all of this information has been coming out and we need to raise the alarm bell that the government is out there talking about biodiversity and committing money while at the same time saying we're expanding the tar sands. A single round-trip ticket from Kagluktuk, Nunavut to the closest city centre of Yellowknife Northwest Territories will cost you around $1,000. That's if you can afford it. Many make tough decisions on what they will go without, whether it's food or paying rent. 
Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs brings you this story on Arctic prices. Fantastic. Augustus. Mr. Magneto. Mary Talley took pinches every penny to get by. Living in the remote community of Kluktuk in western Nunavut, fuel, shelter, goods, and travel cost a small fortune. So when she's told she owes $300 in order to rebook her kids' dental appointments, she has to make tough decisions. I asked if Maya could be rebooked because I wanted the two children to fly out at the same time. So I was wondering how am I going to come up with $300? I know I received the child tax, but with their needs, it's practically all gone like in two days. Teletuk's five-year-old daughter Maya has been waiting since November of 2021 to go down south and receive critical dental work. I was scared because because seeing my child in pain from her from her abscess, and then at that at the time she had the abscess, she wasn't eating. And she, there were times where she, she'd cry and cry and cry because she's hungry. In the meantime, as she waits for that dental appointment, she puts the majority of her money into feeding her four kids. According to the latest statistics from Nunavut's Food Security Coalition, nearly 70% of Inuit homes in the territory are food insecure. Airfare is also six to ten times more expensive than ground freight in other remote regions. Once a year, the sea lift delivers goods, significantly reducing the cost. But even this year's sky-high inflation has made it hard to predict the rising expenses. Kimnick Klinkenberg is a young mother who's worked in retail and food supply on and off for five years. When the store orders sea lift they do it ahead by year and that's your sea lift order but you still have to make sure the store has enough food for the community so you're ordering things and it comes in by freight a couple of weeks ago there was an issue with weather down south mm -hmm. so we didn't get freight for like a week the store is empty in her experience when the stores risk losing money it's the community who pays the price. We go back to like the freight, the fuel to fly a plane here. Then we just got that tax on oils and stuff. That's that's hurting. Yeah. The cost of flying food up here, heavy things. Just to keep the store clean. They would order dustbane, and it would be $100 for a small little box. Yeah. That's just to keep the store clean. So what are mothers in Kuluktuk doing? Upgrading their skills and searching for better paying jobs. Stay tuned for part two of this story about how one employment program is working to ensure that no family goes hungry. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Kolok Talk. Thanks, Charlotte. Important story. Looking forward to part two. Time for one more quick break. Coming up, Anti in Residence. What two universities are doing to help Indigenous students overcome the challenges of life in residence. So having an auntie, we think, will help encourage students to uh, showcase who they are and where they come from.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Paul Hollingsworth submitted this photo showing us where Lake Superior meets the Norwester Mountains in Northern Ontario. Look stunning, Paul. Thanks for sharing with us. If you have a photo to share, you can email that photo to share at aptn.ca and it might be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at your Saturday weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, minus three with flurries in Halifax, two below and snow in Fredericton. Minus 18 with the sun out in Kujuwak, plus one and flurries in Nain. Sunny and minus five in Montreal, sunny and 14 below in Shibugamu. Minus three and cloudy for Sault Ste. Marie, sun's out and minus five in North Bay. Zero with snow in Thunder Bay, flurries and two below in Sioux Lookout. Minus 11 in God's Lake in the Paw, 10 below for Norway House. Minus two with snow in Winnipeg, minus 11 for Dauphin. Six below and snow for Regina and North Battleford. Minus eight in Meadow Lake, 10 below with snow in La Ronge. Over in Northern Alberta, minus 18 with snow in Fort Chip, 17 below in Fort McMurray, minus seven in snow in Edmonton, plus two in Lethbridge. Six above for Vancouver and Victoria, minus six and snow for Prince George and Smithers. 17 below with snow in Old Crow and Beaver Creek, minus 16 in Whitehorse. 18 below for Yellowknife, minus 26 in Norman Wells. Snow and 22 below for Saks Harbor, minus 21 in Politech. Minus 13 for Chesterfield with snow, 30 below in Cambridge Bay. Minus 21 in Resolute, 17 below with snow in Igloolik. Universities can be overwhelming for Indigenous students, but now for the first time in the Atlantic region, two universities have hired a Mi'kmaq auntie in residence. It's to offer cultural support and help students with campus life. With more, here's Angel Moore. Emily Picto Roberts understands the challenges Indigenous students face. She may be an alumni of King's College, but she struggled to complete her degree. Because as you can imagine, with colonial restraints um, in an institution like this and having sort of traditional ways of thinking and, and having you know, 300 years of recent Mi'kmaq uh, knowledge, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit different to, to, to reconcile. Now Picto Roberts of the Millbrook First Nation is doing something to help. She's the first Insui in residence. Insui is a Mi'kmaq word for auntie, and at the University of King's College and Mount St. Vincent University, she'll be offering cultural, spiritual, and academic support for Indigenous students. So it took me a really long time, and I went through many aunties that I created myself and, and stretched a lot of people thin. So what I want to do is be that resource that I really needed. And Katie Merwin is the Dean of Students at the University of King's College. She hopes the auntie in residence will attract more Indigenous students and help students feel less isolated on campus. So I think many universities are primarily white institutions and we want Indigenous students to feel like they can take up all the space they deserve in our campus, in our social life, in our academic life. So having an auntie we think will help encourage students to uh, showcase who they are and where they come from 28-year-old Picto Roberts spends one day a week on each campus. She says there is about 30 Indigenous students at King's College and over 160 at Mount St. Vincent University. So far, the feedback from students is positive. It's been amazing. I have met so many students who just genuinely needed a shoulder to sort of lean on and, and need some support in, in ways that they haven't been able to access so far and just seeing the relief on their faces has has been amazing. The Saskatchewan Institute of Technologies in Saskatoon also has an auntie in residence. Picto Roberts hopes more universities will follow. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, also known as Halifax. Great program. 
The Arctic Inspiration Prize awards $3 million annually to Northern projects and for Northerners. And this year's nominees are in. The project can be in education, sustainable housing, health, performing arts, traditional knowledge, language, or science. This year there are eight finalists in three categories. Last year, the Halloween Music Society received a million dollar prize and a Nunavik project for a healing center also took home the same amount. One of this year's nominees is hoping to build a database of Northern di digital images made by Northern youth. And it's something I've noticed uh, in my work, um, trying to find graphics that are specific to Nunavut and specific to Inuit is very difficult and most times requires that, you know, we have to go and get those custom made for us. Um, so I like really, I guess, like just to wrap it all up would be, you know, this project is meant to make that easier for people and allow you to have a voice in what they're trying to say and like what type of advertisements they want. Good luck to all the finalists. Finally tonight, a BC woman recorded a priceless moment when a baby bobcat made a pit stop on her back porch. Oh my <clears throat> gosh. Look at what we've got. The curious kitten was paying a visit to her domestic cousin, the owner's house cat. Oh, super cute there. A rare sighting that's racked up millions of views online. No kidding. Well, that's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Friday. It's been a busy week. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Have a great weekend.